Hi everyone. In today's video, I'm going to be going through the atrial natriuretic peptide cascade, or the ANP cascade. Now, the ANP cascade is a key mechanism or sequence of events that occurs in the body when the body recognizes that the blood pressure is too high and therefore allows for many mechanisms to occur in an attempt to lower the blood pressure. Now, as the name suggests, atrial natriuretic peptide originates from the atria of the heart. And it's actually created by cells that are present near the sinoatrial node, so within the right atrium. And these cells, when they're stretched excessively uh, due to an increased blood pressure, they allow for the release of this atrial natriuretic peptide. So if we start our cascade within the right atrium, or let's just write atria of the heart, cells within this atria release atrial natriuretic peptide. Now, atrial natriuretic peptide, like the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, has four main effects on the body. And these effects are pretty much antagonistic of what angiotensin 2 does in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. The first effect that I want to talk about is a, an inhibition of renin release because once you inhibit renin you've pretty much inhibited the body's ability to increase blood pressure in an observable manner because if you've already seen my video on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or if you've known about it the renin angiotensin aldosterone system has a very large effect on the body in terms of what it can actually do to change blood pressure because it affects so many different types of hormones and parts of the body. So ANP goes from the atria within the heart to the juxtaglomerular cells and these are the cells if you rem remember uh, that release renin which is the enzyme that allows for the conversion of angiotensin into angiotensin 1. So it affects the juxtaglomerular cells and this inhibits or decreases renin release. And it's going to be pretty self-explanatory from now on, but once we inhibit renin release, then well, we have to inhibit or decrease angiotensin 2 production as well. So essentially, the entirety of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is inhibited. But you'll also see later on in the video that ANP also allows for direct inhibition of angi sorry, aldosterone release as well. So essentially, in terms of aldosterone, there's a double whammy here because not only is aldosterone inhibited in its release through the renin angiotensin aldosterone system being inhibited, However, it's also inhibited by ANP directly. So going back to the cascade, decreased renin release causes decreased angiotensin 2 release. And that subsequently, if you remember, uh, one of angiotensin 2's effects is to allow for vasoconstriction. So if we decrease angiotensin 2 levels, we'll allow for vasodilation. And subsequently, that results in an increase in blood pressure. And if you remember my video where I talked about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, I made the comment that an increase in the volume of a substance within the same size container increases the pressure. However, in this case, we've got an increased container with the same amount of volume. So if we increase the space that the volume is present in, then we're decreasing the pressure, which uh, allows for a decrease in blood pressure. So another effect that atrial natriuretic peptide has on the body is it affects the brain. And in affecting the brain, it decreases the amount of ADH that is released from the supraoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus and subsequently secreted through the posterior pituitary gland. So if we decrease ADH levels, then what does that mean? 
Well, essentially, ADH prevents from water being excreted out of the body through urine. So if we decrease the amount of ADH that is being released, then we are decreasing the amount of collecting ducts that are being expressed uh, on, sorry, not collecting ducts, but aquaporins being expressed on those collecting ducts to allow for a reduction in the amount of water being taken back from the urinary system, i.e. the kidneys, into the blood. So if we have a reduction in water going back into the blood, more water is being excreted, which means that there is a greater amount of urine production, which means that blood volume decreases, decreasing the blood pressure as well. So as I mentioned already, decreased ADH has an effect on the collecting ducts. And I'll just write decreased aquaporin expression. And this decreased aquaporin expression means that there is decreased sodium ion and water reabsorption, which, as I said before, decreases blood volume and therefore allows for a decrease in blood pressure. The third effect that ANP has on the body, as I mentioned before, is the double whammy to aldosterone. A and P, in addition to allowing for an inhibition of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, also directly inhibits the adrenal cortex in the uh, production of aldosterone to allow for a reduced sequestering of ions uh, within the blood. And if we reduce the amount of sodium and potassium being brought back into the blood while well, that sodium and potassium is going into the urine and as we all know wherever ions go water follows so if the concentration of ions within urine is too high then the body tries to decrease the concentration of ions within urine by allowing for more water to be present within that urine allowing for a greater urine volume that means that blood volume decreases and more water is excreted out of the body. So in summary, the adrenal cortex is activated to decrease the amount of aldosterone. And as aldosterone has a, an effect on the collecting ducts, we can just draw a, an arrow that goes directly from aldosterone to the collecting ducts to decrease um, the blood pressure. Now, the fourth effect is quite similar to what we've been already been talking about with ADH and aldosterone. And the effect is that ANP actually has a direct effect on the collecting ducts of the kidneys. And that direct effect is that it prevents the ability of water to flow from the collecting ducts back into the blood to increase blood volume. So as you can see, it has kind of a similar effect to ADH in that it prevents water from flowing back and allows for that water to flow back into the urine and out of the body. Now you may be wondering that although all of these processes are occurring, there must be some way to prevent blood pressure from dropping too low because even though we want blood pressure to remain low and not too high, there is a lower limit that prevents us from going uh, undergoing syncope uh, as well as a lack of proper perfusion of organs. So what is that process? Well, essentially, when there's a decrease in blood pressure, there will be a negative feedback attributed or established between this drop in blood pressure and the cells within the atria of the heart that allow for the release of ANP. So this large arrow that I'm drawing here shows that this negative feedback prevents the release of ANP from the heart. And that makes sense because if we have a reduction in blood pressure, there's going to be a decrease in the amount of stretch that the cells that allow for the release of ANP undergo within the heart. And as the main stimulus for these cells to release 
ANP is stretching of these cells. If there's a lack of stretching, then they won't release ANP in the first place. So therefore, there is a negative feedback established. So in review, in summary, there are four main effects that ANP has on the body. After it's been released, due to an increase in the stretch of the cells in the heart present within the atria. These four effects include decreasing renin release, which prevents the formation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which allows for vasodilation and therefore a decrease in blood pressure. There is an increase in ADH um, suppression, which means that ADH is not released from the supraoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus and therefore it means that there is decreased aquaporin expression in the collecting ducts, which means that there is decreased reabsorption of sodium and water uh, within the collecting ducts, which means that there is a decrease in blood volume and therefore blood pressure. There is also a decrease in aldosterone, which means that there is a decrease in the amount of ions that are taken from the collecting ducts back into the blood. And there is also a direct inhibition of the collecting ducts uh, as well as ADH in a similar mechanism of action to prevent an increase in drug volume whilst allowing for an increase in urine volume to allow for um, a decrease in blood pressure as more water is being lost to the external environment. And the control that this process has is through a negative feedback mechanism by a decreased blood pressure allowing for a decreased stretch in the cells of the heart that allow for the production of ANP. And this decreased stretch means that the cells are not stimulated to release ANP and therefore blood pressure can go back to homeostatic levels if it's reached a, a level that is too low. So I hope that has all made sense today and thank you very much for watching.